today we begin our new series called Did God Really Say That? Taking a break from the gospel according to John as many of you are on vacation this summer. You'll miss a week here, miss a week there, barbecues, family events. We kind of like taking a break from expository preaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and, and do some topical stuff and give you a, maybe a teach on some greater um, subjects of scripture. We'll try to keep things in context, but we're going to deal with some broad ranges of questions and, and, and biblical truth as we look through a, a seven-part series called, Did God Really Say That? So I want to join you not only in this series, but if you miss a week, you're on vacation, you can join us on our website, kingschapel.net, download the audio, uh, pick up a CD on the way out, or even the video and podcasting is available for you. Did God really say that? That's our series uh, this summer. So um, let's watch this video together and let's ask, did God really say that? Guys, I'm going to college in two months. College. I'm not ready to be an adult. What if it's like harder than everyone says? What if I fail? What if I'm like a weirdo and no one likes me? I'm freaking out. I have four finals and then this huge paper due and it's just so much. I don't know how I'm gonna do it all. You're freaking out? I start a job next week. I don't even know what a job is. What if I do bad? What if I get fired on my first day? What am I supposed to do? Guys, quit your complaining. You've got nothing to worry about. Remember, God won't give you more than you can handle. I think all our favorite is, I don't even know what a job is. That was, <laughs> he got a job this week. He knows what a job is now. I'll tell you what. God won't give you more than you can handle. Did God really say that? It was Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers in England in the 19th century, who said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Our question this morning, did God really say that, is based on a familiar phrase that sounds almost as if it might be right, that God won't give you any more than you can handle. It's not what he said. But this advice, let's be honest, I'm not here to beat you up, I've I've used this before, I've said this before, some of you are like, yeah, I've actually used that phrase before. We get caught in these situations, in these circumstances, and we're hearing the hurts and the pains of other people, and they're sharing their trials, their, their problems, the, the very trying, complicated circumstance they're going through. And although you want to say something that will be helpful, you give them a tried advice and a cliche and silly instructions, and you say, God will close doors, but he will open windows. If you're on the 96th floor and the Manhattan high rise, it's not a good idea. Will God give you more than you can handle? Never said that. I have a vision of saying this. God will never give you. You know, you know how those preachers are. They, they want to give you only the positive. When God closes a door, he opens a window. It's not in the Bible. God never said that. Now, we move into the series again. You may hear some things going, oh, yeah, I have said that before. I have. Join the club. Okay? But... There are times in our life that we, we just don't know what to say. And, and, and maybe you were on the receiving end. Maybe you're sharing a burden of brokenness. And someone says to you, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. And you're thinking right now, he's better give me the strength not to punch you in the throats. Because that's what I feel like <laughs> I'm going through right now. It's overwhelming. I'm struggling. And that's all you got. God never said he will not give us more than we can handle. In fact, if you read your Bible, you will see over and over again situations and people coming to the end of themselves feeling like God has given them a lot more than they can handle. Moses, goes, God goes to Moses in the bush. It's burning. Like the Wizard of Oz and the, and the, and the Oz is burning. And the Lord says, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Let the free you know, work and labor go so they can worship me. And Moses says to him, really? Have you ever heard me speak, Lord? I'm not very good. Many scholars believe he had a speech impediment. 
God hears the cries of the Israelites in the book of Judges, and he calls Gideon to rescue them. And how does Gideon respond? Judges 6, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the weakest in my father's house. Mighty King David gets busted by Samuel for his sexual sin, and his wickedness overwhelmed, he says. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin, for my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. There are many people in many places in Scripture where people feel overwhelmed beyond their strength to carry on. So we have to ask the question, where did the idea that God will never give you more than you can handle come from? I'm glad you asked. Turn in your Bibles first to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 is the culprit of where people get the idea that God won't give you more than you can handle. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Okay? A little context here. We studied 1 Corinthians a few years ago. Corinth is a jacked up, twisted church, got lots of problems. There's sin in the congregation, there's disunity among the people, they're abusing spiritual gifts, on and on and on. I hear it all the time, we need to be a first century church, really? Not like Corinth, we don't. One of the issues of the church is that there was, they were eating food offered to idols, if you remember that, from chapter 8. And Paul makes it clear as he's teaching on this food offering to idols that if you're an older, mature Christian, and it's okay for you to eat chicken wings that came from the temple of a part pagan god, don't use your freedom and, and the liberties that you have to hurt a weaker Christian who will fall into sin because of your freedoms and your liberties. That's chapter 8. Chapter 9, Paul goes to a personal instruction that says, listen, in the same way I have the right to be paid monetary gain as I preach the gospel, but I, I decided not to take any money from you. Why? Because I don't want to be disqualified. I don't want to be disqualified from preaching the gospel. All right? He would have hindered Paul. And then in chapter 10, we see this whole idea of not being disqualified from declaring the gospel, spreading the gospel. And Paul gives them a historical overview in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians 1 through 10. And basically he says, listen, history of, we could look at some of the history of Israel and we see why they were disqualified. Verses 6 through 10 says they were disqualified because they were evil. They were idolaters. They were sexual immoral among them. They were testing the Lord and their grumbling was an affront to God, to God's sovereignty, to God's providential care. And what was the result? Paul says they died. And then in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, he mentions that Israel's disqualification from proclaiming the, the goodness of God and the greatness of God was an example. If you've got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it was an example. I'm writing these things as an example to you, he says, for your instruction. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands, if you think you're better than Israel... If you think you're better than the past and the instruction I'm giving to you, take heed lest you fall. So in other words, what Paul is saying is don't be overconfident in these liberties and, and these freedoms uh, could go too far where you could fall into sin and disqualify you from the race. Lose your usefulness in the power and the presentation of the gospel when you're living in sin. Don't do that. Then comes the famous verse. Hmm. No temptation has overtaken you, which is common to man. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. With these words, Paul assures the Corinthian church that their situation is not hopeless. God remains true. God remains true and he'll provide a way of escape from temptation. 
We, we therefore can't say after we have been enticed to sin that God was not faithful. James 1, no one can say that when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God doesn't tempt you to do evil. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. God is faithful. We are sinful. He never promised to remove the temptation, but provides a way for escape. The picture is cutting through a mountain and a valley and escaping. And he will always provide for us a way of escape so that we remain useful in his hands, that we would rather be disqualified and sidetracked from the mission of declaring and demonstrating the gospel, we will be on mission with him, living not in rebellion, but in submission to him. So Paul's reminding them in this verse that the sovereign God will not put us in situations where we cannot turn from sin, and he will provide a way out of those situations that would entice us to rebel against him. Sometimes, all you have to do is to remember Forrest Gump. That's it. So if you're committed to sin, or you're at least tempted to sin, and, and it's the fork is right there, remember Forrest Gump. Run. Run, Forrest, run. Paul tells young Timothy, flee youthful lusts and passions and pursue righteousness, right? So we feel trapped. God provides a way to flee from sin. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the faithfulness of God. If someone is struggling in sin, you can say, God will not give you more than you can handle. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Run from sin, according to this passage. But that's very different from a situation. In the brokenness, trials, and difficulties, and hardships, overwhelming life circumstances, in this broken world, all the nonsense and brokenness that this world throws at us, that we say, oh, no, don't worry. God will give you more than you can handle. Maybe a wayward child. A recent divorce, a death, a devastating doctor's report, a loss of a job. Whatever the world, this broken world throws at you, you feel completely overwhelmed. a whole different story. It's been said, you either are coming out of a difficult time, going into a difficult time, or getting ready to go into a difficult time. Some of you can relate to that even this morning. Have you ever been so, have you ever been to the place where you were so, it was so dark that your heart feels like it's going to shatter? Have you ever had a situation that was so, so painful. The only words you can come up with to describe what you're going through is, I am numb. I have. Hurting beyond measure, deeply struggling with life. Sure felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Sure felt like God was giving me more than I could handle. So what I want to do in our time together is I want to look at two main stories. So I hope you have your Bibles with you. Uh, two main stories in the Bible where people are at the end of themselves. The trials and the difficulties and the pains and the hurts are so overwhelming. They're deeply hurt, hurt beyond what they can bear. Two stories, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And then as we look to the stories, we'll end with four practical ways or four practical things that you can walk away with, lessons from them that we could walk away when, and hopefully it's on occasion, God does give us more than we can handle. Okay? So let's look at two stories, then we'll end with four practical things. Uh, four practical ways and, and uh, principles we could take away. Number one, 2 Kings chapter 6 is in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First and Second Samuel, and then Kings. I'll read it to you, but if you have your Bible, that's great. There are Bibles in the back if you need one. We're in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. The ministry of a prophet named Elisha. Verse 24 says, afterwards, after Elijah had done some miracles 
after some of the things that he performed by the hand of God. It was clear that God Almighty was with him. Elisha asked for a double portion of the prophet Elijah, who had been taken up to heaven, uh, a double portion of his spirit, and God just working through Elisha with all kinds of miracles in Israel, the northern kingdom, its city, Samaria. Bring you a little context. Verse 24 says, Afterwards, after some of Elijah's mighty miracles, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. Okay? Now, King Jehoram of Israel is a wicked king. Israel had no good kings at when the, after the kingdom split. Grabs all his people, and they run into Samaria, and they lock down the city. So they're in the city. Israel's in the city. The people are in the city. The king is in the city. It's locked down. They're under siege. The army of Syria has surrounded the city. They can't get in. They can't get out. No food. Nothing coming in. Nothing going out. That's the scene. It got so bad, it says in chapter 6, that the donkey's head, which was considered not good to eat, worth not a penny, was sold for 80 shekels of silver. 200 shekels of silver, excuse me. You know, 80, 80, I got it right. 80 shekels is about $200. I hope you ate breakfast. Bird poop was sold for five shekels of silver. Look at verse 6, uh, 26. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 26. Now, he says, as the king of Israel is passing by the wall, a woman cried out to him, Help my lord, O king. Verse 27, chapter 6, 2 Kings. Verse 27, he said, If the Lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor, where the grain is, or from the wine press, where the drink was. And the king asked her, What is your trouble? She answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today. Yes, ugh. And we will eat my son tomorrow. That's a good mom right there. So we boiled, verse 29, we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day I said to her, give me your son. But she hid her son. Verse 30, when the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes, sign of mourning and distress. Now he was passing by the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth beneath his body. Okay, that's, again, a sign of brokenness, despair. Verse 31, and he said, may God do to me, and more also, if the head... Of Elisha, that's the prophet of God, the son of Shephat, remains on his shoulders today. He wants him dead. Now, I would imagine if someone came into town and said to the mothers and to the king and to the inhabitants, listen, don't worry. God won't give you more than you can handle. Let's all agree having to eat children is more than you can handle. That's the famine in the city. That's the circumstance that they find themselves. I know it's gross. I'm reading the Bible. Turn in your Bible now in the New Testament to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. After the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you got Romans, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Second, and then, of course, 2 Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Just, again, a little bit of context. Paul had already wrote the letter, first letter to the Corinth church. Actually, this is really his third letter. One was lost. Um, but he's, so he's writing it to this church in which he planted while he was in Corinth. Um, Paul is writing them a, a, another letter. And if you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he speaks of all our afflictions. You see that? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, well, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may comfort others with the comfort we have gotten from God. Okay? So most of the, most of the affliction that Paul is talking about is when he was in Asia. Right between his first letter and his second letter, Paul went on a gospel preaching tour, planting churches in Asia. So let me just read to you 2 Corinthians. I'll give you the places where Paul... Hits it throughout the book, different places in the book, 2 Corinthians, where he's talking about the affliction. I want you to see more than you can handle, Paul. Let's see. I'll read it to you. Just listen, listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. 
chapter 6. As servants of God, we command ourselves in every way by great endurance in affliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. That's a, that's a list right there. We are treated as impostors, yet we're true. Dying and beheld, we live, punished yet not killed. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Poor, but making many rich. My personal favorite is in chapter 11. Paul's talking about the affliction that he, was, that he had gone through. Chapter 11, verse 24, that's what he says. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. That's whipping on the back. With leather and steel. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And he's not talking about a bong. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was drifting at sea. In dangers from rivers and robbers and, and people. Danger from Gentiles. Dangers in the wilderness. Dangers at sea. False brothers. In toil and hardships through many sleepless nights. In hunger and thirst and without food. In cold and exposed. And apart from other things, the daily pressures of me and the anxieties for all the churches. Paul never got the memo. God doesn't give you more than you can handle. I'll tell you that right now. This wasn't Paul boasting in some sadistic way. It wasn't Paul looking for sympathy from the Corinthian church. It was Paul, the, the apostle, the pastor, the church planter, wanted to teach them about the sufficiency of Christ. Look at verse 8 in chapter 1 at our text. Okay? So that's the suffering he endured throughout the letter. He tells them about it. But look what he says right in the beginning of chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction, which we just talked about, we experienced in Asia. Verse, nine, verse 8, yeah. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. Can anybody say, yes, I've been there? Beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt, he says in verse 9, that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Now, I think it's important to recognize now, in this moment, that Paul, according to your tradition, was martyred in the faith. So we can say with confidence that Paul was not always delivered earthly deliverance in every despair. Nero had his head cut off. There was a time in which God said, you're coming home. And allowed Nero to do what he needed to do, or had to do, or wanted to do. Okay? So here's King, 2 Kings 6, broken Siege city, lots of stress. Paul, same thing, a lot going on. And let's draw some principles then from these two stories, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Number one, when God gives us more than we can handle, and he does on, at times, number one is we need to rely on his personal presence. Two parts to this. Number one, Many of you can testify this morning that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a Christian today. Because of a situation, a very, very dark, broken, crushing circumstance in your life brought you to the end of yourself. And God revealed his personal presence to you. Now, I realize some of you, you were three years old. You were four years old, the only thing you had to worry about is potty training, and your Sunday school teacher led you to faith. And you haven't looked back since. That's awesome. But for the rest of us, we had to go through some dark halls, dark ways, broken circumstances, all kinds of sin, and for us to get to the place where we got hit upside the head and got to the end of ourselves and said, I give up. That's exactly what happened to me. And some of you can identify of the brokenness in your life that God revealed your false worship, your idolatry, and then revealed his beautiful son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness of sins. Some of you know that. And it was those times, I think, many times, that God brings us into a relationship with himself. In the scripture, we see people trusting God in prison, getting ready to drown in a lake, being so self-centered that they're driven out on a grassy field eating like a cow. 
There are others that were so broken over their sins, you find them just falling down and weeping at the feet of Jesus. God crushes us because God wants to save us. And maybe you're there now. Maybe you have not had a relationship with Christ. You do not know him as Lord and Savior and forgiveness uh, has not forgiven you of your sins, but God is calling you. And he's bringing you through a dark place, a dark trial in your life because he wants you to get to the end of yourself so you could say like Peter who was stepping out of the boat going down and drowning, save me. That's the case. Call upon the Lord. Trust in his personal presence. But the second thing, I think, look at verse 8 of chapter... Um, 2 Corinthians 1.8. We just read it. And 1.9. For we were utterly beyond burden, without strength, despairing of life. Number, uh, verse 9. Indeed, it's right there up on the screen too. We felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us what? Rely not on ourselves, but on God. Let me ask you a question. Let's be honest. When is God's presence more real? Where do you experience God's personal presence in your life, in trial or in success? When there's a storm or when things are going just fine? You don't have to answer that. I'll answer it for you. When storms come in our life, when there are trials and hardships in our life, we fall flat on our face and we're calling out to God. It's just the way we are. Now, it's easy to enjoy good times, beautiful days, and blessings, and forget Jesus. I don't think it, you know, it may not be deliberate, but it's those moments when things are going well, we get sidetracked, and we get busy doing other things, and we don't rely moment by moment on God. When the storm comes, we cry out. How many of us can testify to the fact that we have grown deeper how many of us can testify that we have grown deeper in love and relationship with Jesus when we've been given more than we can handle? Paul experienced the personal presence of God in the storm of life. Relying on his presence is hard because it's, 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 it's not only giving advice but receiving it because it's not concrete. It, 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 it's about spiritual reality. It, it, it's not always a quick answer, a quick fix. To rely upon the Lord, to trust in His personal presence doesn't just fix things. We like things being fixed. From time to time, God gives us more than we can handle so that we truly have to choose to rely and depend on His presence in our life. But here's the problem, family. Is that we tendency, our tendency because we are selfish people is to, question, is to question God's presence in the midst of a storm. We're in a storm, we're wondering, where are you? What we need to always remember is that although we are in this pervasive storm, we are never outside the personal presence of God. And we have to tell ourselves and remind ourselves and run to the scriptures and read just like Jonah who is, who is in the midst of a storm. He's running from God. He doesn't want to preach to Nineveh. And he goes down to the boat, and then off he goes. And, and, and the storm comes, and, and the sailors, you know the story, chuck him overboard. Okay, he's in the ocean. A storm has come. That's not bad enough. A giant fish eats him. Jonah 2, I called out to the Lord in my distress. Not my success. I've called out to the Lord. I don't want nothing to do with the Lord. Well, I'm running away and minding my own business, doing what I want to do. But in my distress, I called out to the Lord. And he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. That means into the very presence of God. It was King David who said in Psalm 144, 145, The Lord is near to all. The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Maybe you're in a difficult place right now. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're, maybe you're struggling, maybe there's a trial, and you need to hear the word of the Lord, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Don't look at the storm in your life and think God is not present. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
Back in 2 Kings, if you read the story, it's Elisha that the king wanted to kill. Why? Because Elisha represented the presence of God. Elisha said, rain it, rain. Elijah said, don't rain it, don't rain. It didn't rain. He was God's man. He was God's spokesman. And if you read the story uh, that the wicked king in the midst of the story, in the midst of this storm in the city, he wanted Elisha dead. You don't run from God. You run to God. The king wanted nothing to do with God. Just like Judas wanted nothing to do with God when he was in his storm. But it was while they were under siege in that city with nothing to eat, death everywhere, that God's personal presence through his word became known through Elisha. Chapter 7, verse 1, I'll read it to you. Right after all this is going on in this besieged city, chapter 7, verse 1, hear the word of the Lord. This is going to Elisha, the prophet. Hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. God is present. God is among his people. God is speaking. And the Lord, excuse me, Elijah hears from the Lord and responds. And he is the spokesman for uh, God. And he says, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel. And two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. That's regular prices. Then the captain, on whose hand the king leaned, said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, how could this be? But Elisha said to him, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Family, trust in God's word. Trust in God's personal presence through his promise in the word of God. Trust in his promise. It, it, it does not just remove pain immediately, but his presence through his word and through his spirit will comfort your soul in the midst of a storm. One of the verses I love to run to in the times, difficult times, and, and, and the, the numbness in my life was Psalm 25. I would always turn to Psalm 25 every day. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and I am afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive me of all my sins. God's presence in my life. We're not meant to try really hard to get through life. We're not meant to really carry our burdens in this fallen world. We are meant to realize that we can't do it on our own. The truth is, all of life is more than we can handle, but not more than Jesus can handle. Come to me, Jesus said, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God gives us more than we can handle. Because it forces us to rely upon his personal presence in our life. Number two, because it's the opportunity to receive his perfect power. The Apostle Paul, again in 2 Corinthians, this time in chapter 12. If you know the story, it says in verse 7, so to keep me from being conceited, he had been brought up to the third heavens. He was getting revelation upon revelation. He said, from keeping me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. He goes on to say that he pleaded with the Lord, prayed and pleaded with the Lord three times for it to be removed. Now, I think not only Paul was praying, but I think everyone around Paul, I'm sure, was given a list. Pray for the Apostle Paul. Pray for the thorn to be removed. Plead with God on his behalf. But verse 9 says, but he said to me, that's God. Huh, no. For my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My grace, my, my unconditional love for you is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace, relying upon me, will get you through. How? By power that's made perfect in weakness. You see that? The word perfect means to accomplish what it's set out to do, to, to make it happen, to accomplish. It, it, it's in the present tense, so it's continual. 
It's indicative, which means it's a fact, and it's a passive voice, which means God is doing it. So what Paul is saying very clearly is there is absolute assurance that he has from God, it's a fact, that he will always give him the grace when he is weak. See that? Suffering that causes you and I to come to the end of self not only promotes a healthy prayer life, but makes us dependent upon the power of Almighty God. Was it sinful for Paul to pray? Take this thorn for me? No, it wasn't. God's not obligated to heal every time you ask. We're going to talk about that next week. Two weeks. But God does obligate himself here to give you his strength, his power, his grace to glorify him in it. When he is all we have, he becomes all we need. When he is all we have, he becomes all we need. And in order to receive this power, God says we must be weak. Well, how do you become weak? By getting more than you can handle is the answer. The opposite of weak is not strength, really. It's pride and independence. So why hardships and calamities and troubles? Why the job loss? Why am I trapped in this this awful marriage? Why does my father have cancer? Why can't I have children? Why is nothing working out in my life? Why are you doing this, oh God, making us weak? Desiring us to feel totally inadequate and insufficient in ourselves so that his divine power, his mercy and grace will have its full scope and strength in our weakness. If you're like me and you want to get things done on your own strength, it hurts. But I'm reminded, look at verse 10, to be humble. For the sake of Christ, then I will content with my weakness. Insults, hardship, persecution, calamities. For when I am weak, what? I'm strong. The greater the person acknowledges weakness, the more evident of Christ's enabling power. Okay? Paul will accept his affliction to bring glory to his God because he was brought to the place of dependency. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn again to our scripture reading, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's just look at that one more time and then we'll move on. Paul is crystal clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We don't want you to be unaware of the affliction. We're beyond our strength. Verse 9. We have felt that we have received the sentence of death, but that was to make us very clear. Rely on ourselves, not rely on ourselves, but on God who what? Raises the dead. That's power. The God who raises the dead, who gives life to dead. He delivered us. That's the power of God again from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Our hope is on him. We're, 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 we're keeping our eyes resting and trusting in his power in our life. Paul recognized that when he faced hardship, it was to bring God glory by trusting him in what God was doing. Suffering for Paul was not a dictator, but was a servant as he began to grow in the grace of God, relying on his presence, trusting in his power. There are circumstances in our life that are just so difficult for us. And the only way we can get through it is through the power and grace of God. And we get to that place where we start saying, Lord, I can't do this. I need you. I'm just going to have to wait to see and watch you do what only you can do. I can't do it. There's a place in 2 Kings as well. Um, I, I have it written down. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay, yeah. Back in 2 Kings, let me tell you the story. We're talking about the, the powerful, the perfect power of God. As the story goes on in 2 Kings, you can read this later. I'll just tell you. The, the presence of God comes through the man Elisha. He's the, he's the prophet. He's the presence. He, he represents the presence of God. And God uses him to bring forth his power. What happens in that story in chapter 7 is God calls a couple of lepers to leave the city. And these lepers leave the city and they're thinking to themselves, listen, I know we're besieged by an enemy army. We're in here. We're dying. We're starving to death. 
we're going to go out of the city and go to the Syrian army, that's our enemy, and we'll just say to them, listen, we're here, we want to eat. If they kill us, they kill us. It's probably faster that way than sitting here starving. But if we can get what we got to get and get what we need, all the better. So we have nothing to lose. What happens is they leave the city. They're, they're approaching the enemy. They're thinking, all right, I saw it in the chest a lot faster than starving to death, right? God, in his awesome power, sends a mighty sound upon the enemy camp. They think that it's chariots and horses that are coming for them. And what do they do? They get out of there. They're like, oh, the mighty army is coming. They grab their stuff and they leave. And there's four lepers, that three or four lepers walking into town. They're like, there's nobody here. Everything was left behind. You know what they did? They sat down and started eating and drinking. They had food. The city finds out what's happened, and they go out, and God feeds his people by the power of God. It wasn't them. It wasn't how smart they were. It wasn't by their own strength or uh, 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 any kind of cleverness and plan. It was by the power of God. God brings us to the place where we cannot do it on our own so he can display his loving grace and power in our life. Number three, rely on his presence, receive his power, and look what he said. Look what I'm saying here. Rest in his prescribed, prescribed meaning, appointed purposes. Now, I hesitate to talk about this, but I'm going to because it's very important and it's biblical. Because I don't want to take the place of God, and I don't want to tell you exactly what God is doing in your life during the hardship and the deep stress you guys are going through. I don't know. I, I, but I do know one thing. I do, not, I do know that the Bible is absolutely crystal clear. The Bible reveals to us that God is sovereign over the universe, and he's moving all of history, establishing, appointing, ordaining all of history as prescribed purposes to its final conclusion. God's sovereignty means he has the, all the power, the right and the authority to govern all things, move all things in his wise and eternal plans and purposes that he has established from eternity past for his glory and our good. Even the brokenness and sinfulness and jacked upness of this world is in the hands of God. You can't read this and not know that. You could... You could try to get some philosophy. You can, if you just read your Bible, God is strong enough, omnipotent, powerful, bending. He's not evil. He's no darkness in God. But all the brokenness of this world to the end. Just read Revelation. Okay? I do believe clear what Romans teaches us. Okay? God is not some sadistic God looking out for a thrill of, of evil on you. God is also not a Monday night, you know, Monday afternoon, Monday morning quarterback going, you know what, a lot of evil in the world do. I better fix it today. That's not the Bible, God of the Bible. That's not the God of the Bible. If you believe, and I do, that God revealed himself in his word, then we have to trust verses like Romans 8, Romans 8, 828. And for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1.11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who, what? Works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is not just some philosophical statement that we just need to maybe try to figure out. There's a lot of implications here. Family, I'm here to tell you, and I believe this with my whole heart, the sovereignty and purpose of God for the believer is an anchor for your soul in the midst of, of getting more than you can handle. Because God's sovereignty means God is purposeful. Now our stories in, in 2 Corinthians and in Kings, we, we find some of the purposes of God. For Paul, God wanted him humble. God wanted to rely upon him and not himself. God wanted to increase his faith. In 2 Kings chapter 7, God delivers his people and brings them food. He works through the prophet Elijah and feeds his people. But, it, but if we're honest, there are times in our life that we w really want to know everything that's going on, and, and we don't see everything that God is doing. And then we become, if I can use the term, let's be honest, arrogant. Because if we can't see what an eternal God with eternal purposes is up to, then he must not be up to anything. That's the epitome of arrogance. 
You mean to tell me this little puny little brain can't figure everything out of an eternal God and some way, somehow, then it just can't be figured out? I've got to trust. I've got to believe in God's power, God's sovereignty, God's goodness toward me that he will bring all things according to his holy purposes and plans. So if you cannot reconcile something of the infinite mind of God, don't be so arrogant and think that it can't be recognized that it can't be reconciled. God is working to bring us to rely on him. He wants us to receive his power. He wants us to trust him in the midst of our pain. And let me tell you, Isaiah is right. Our thoughts, his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither his ways our ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways, God says, are higher than yours and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. When God says no, and God allows and permits suffering to come into your life, It is purposeful. Just because we can't see it does not make God a liar. The deepest need that you and I have in weakness and adversity is not quick relief, but a a well-grounded confidence that what is happening is part of the prescribed, the great prescribed purposes of God in the universe for His glory, our good, to display His magnificent, incalculable worth to the world, and to enable us with power by his grace. We have to rely on that. And we have to rely on his presence. We receive his power. We rest in his purposes. And finally, as we go to communion, we need to remember his prized provision. Now, as I'm thinking through this this week, I'm thinking, what about the gospel? You know, in Luke 22, it says that Jesus was betrayed. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. That's what this communion table is about, the bread. He took bread, he broke it, it says. He gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup. That's the cup. And he took the cup and he said, this cup that is poured out for you. My blood is being shed on Calvary. Is the blood of the new covenant. And then he went out from the Garden of Gethsemane. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And the Bible says in the uh, the gospel according to Mark that Jesus went a little bit further fell on his face, and this is what it says in Mark. Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Greatly distressed means astonished or terrified, afraid. Very sorrowful means overcome with horror. One expositor said he felt the shuddering horror of the terrible ordeal. The Son of Man... The Son of God. Feeling overwhelmed and and horror and sorrow and grief. So much so that drops of blood came through his sweat. A, A condition, a rare condition of great emotional stress. Can you imagine Peter? Lord, uh, God won't give you any more than you can handle. I don't think so. It was then that Jesus got, cried out, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but as you will. My Father, personal presence. Let this cup pass, not my will, but thine be done. I believe it. when God gave him the power to say yes. And Jesus rested in his Father's prescribed purposes. Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus was sent by the Father from all eternity To die for us. And then just a few hours later, Jesus led to Calvary and crucified on a Roman cross. He drinks the cup, the judgment, the wrath against sin on our behalf. Our filth, our wickedness, our sin is poured out on Jesus. Darkness comes over the hill of Calvary. And he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As excruciating pain as it was on the cross, that separation from the Father doesn't compare. How did Jesus withstand and follow through? When the circumstances were beyond, beyond bearing, Peter tells us. It says he committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. They couldn't find anything he did wrong. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he was beaten, whipped, beard pulled from his face, 
the crown of thorns on his head. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued, entrusting himself to him. That's the Father, personal presence, who judges justly. He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin, live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. Jesus relies on the Father's presence. Jesus rests in the Father's purposes. And the gospel shows us that we too can rely on the presence of God. Jesus dies an atoning death. He died, uh, paid the penalty for our sin. He paid the price for our sin so that you and I by faith can always be in the midst of whatever we're going through. We can always know and be in the personal presence of God no matter what we're going through. Jesus' death eternally reconciles us to the Father. The gospel shows that we can receive God's perfect power. Jesus becomes weak. Jesus becomes vulnerable as he lays down his life for us. And by his wounds, by his broken body, we are healed, which means we are reconciled to the Father. The gospel shows us that we can rest in God's prescribed purposes because the cross, the greatest sin, horror, sorrow, and anguish was God's way. For us to receive his love, his mercy, his grace, his kindness, and his face in the midst of trial and difficulty. Trust in him this morning, family. Remember his prized provision as we go to the communion table. Remember, you're here, if you were here this morning, maybe you just can't take it any longer. And, and you're, you're, you feel all alone, God is with you. And maybe you're at the place of, of self-reliance. Uh, and it's coming to an end, and you feel like I'm at the end of myself, well, that's a good place to be. It's a good place to turn from your self-reliance and trust in Christ and rely completely on Him. Jesus died for your sins, bore all your sins, past, present, and future. And those who trust in that sacrifice and call upon Him, the Bible says, will be saved, will come into a reconciled relationship with Him. And maybe that's where you're at. The band's going to play. We're going to confess our self-reliance. We're going to return, repent of our self-reliance. And then we're going to celebrate. This table's for the family of God. Not just King's Chapel, but the, for the family. If you belong to Jesus, come to the table. And celebrate his body that was broken, his blood that was shed. Maybe you're here this morning, and if you have a teenager, you're probably going to have a lot of times in your life where God gave you more than you can handle. If you're married, it's going to come a time when God gives you more than you can handle. The gospel shows us there's a God who's strengthened us in our weakness, a God who is purposeful. I want to encourage you as we go to communion to lean on Him. Father, we are self reliant people. We, we want things done our way uh, in our strength. We want to be ones that could say, look at us. That's really anti-gospel. Help us to be a people to say, look at Jesus. We rely upon Jesus. We trust in Jesus. Give us our strength, Jesus, to get through us in this day. And Father, maybe there's some here that are just really at the at really end of their own strength. God, we pray that as the band plays, as we sing, as we respond, by taking the bread, representing Jesus' broken body, the cup, which shows us that his blood was shed for our sins. We pray that your grace is sufficient for us. That your power is made perfect in weakness. And Lord, help us to be people who boast all the more gladly about our weaknesses. Because when we are weak, thou art strong.